thought about you as we watch these protests and this rising of people globally saying acceptance, tolerance, inclusion, love, compassion. It's always been your your message, at least that's what I've gathered from you. So what has been your personal thoughts or emotions watching this kind of swirl around the world right now? Um, I have never been somebody who is anything but like outwardly wry about it and tries to be humorous and take it in stride and keep my emotions in when I feel like I'm doing it right. And that's not always the right answer. Uh, what I want people to know is, uh, I am a white man who can't speak about <clears throat> the fact that there are people in this country who have to, as, as people of color, whether it be black or whatever, uh, who have to tell their kids this speech. I listened to some colleagues talk about this just yesterday, that there's this speech that you give to your kids if you're a black person in this country about how to get home safely and how to handle it if you get pulled over and just make it home. Uh, I don't know what that's like in any way. I don't know what it's like to have my life threatened in that way. But what I can say is for people who don't believe it or think that it's overblown or whatever, uh, every day of my life when I meet somebody new because of how I walk, I get judged. And it's on me to overcome it in some regard, but it also is this stack of very small, little, like paper cut sort of instances that when they pile up, it gets very frustrating to think like, hey, maybe there is an invisible wall or ceiling. And so uh, the one story that comes to mind for me is Dan Dockich and I were doing a game in College Park a couple months ago at the end of the middle of college basketball conference season. And he and I both go walking through a tunnel with our credentials in our hand rather than attached to us. Dan walks through, the usher stops me, grabs my credential out of my hand, begins to tie it to my belt loop without saying a word to me. And I took it from him and I was like, hey, I'm not 12. Um, and so for that moment, I got this reminder that like people see me as lesser in some regard, which again, like that's on me to deal with. Some people are really truly trying to be helpful and my quote unquote plight, because that's not really plight. That's just somebody sort of being a slight annoyance is that I got to deal with it. Well, the extreme of that bias and it's subconscious, like people aren't intentionally being biased, but when, a TV executive tells me to early in my career stick to radio because that's where I'd probably be most successful. Or somebody tells me that like my shoes uh, don't look good enough because I tear shoes apart as I'm walking around. You start to get the thought in your head, like maybe there is a ceiling for my life. And that's not the same, even close to the same as having your life be threatened by a police officer. But if you're wondering, if you're sitting out there and listening to this and you're wondering like, hey, why are they so mad? They being anybody who's protesting. The answer is because when you pile up every day something going wrong or something reminding you that you're slightly lesser than somebody else, at some point you want to let it out and you want people to realize that that's actually happening. And I try to put a happy face on it because that's the way I attack it. But that doesn't mean everybody should, and it certainly means that, that this is true, and it affects people emotionally very substantially. So I would just encourage everybody to listen. So you say you've always put a happy face on it. How often do you have to catch yourself and say, now, you know what, let's change this emotion around. <laughs> let's change this attitude around. Let's make it happy, because that's not originally where your instinct was to go. It's every time. Every time I have to flip the switch and say, nah, not worth it. Because I want to say, like, I get on a plane. I have dragged my bag all the way to the plane door. I get on the plane, and I get the flight attendant saying, can I help you with your bag? In that slow tone that I understand means I think you're stupid. And I just want to say, how do you think I got here in the first place? <laughs> I have made it to the door. The trek was hard and I had a guide, 
But boy, I, thankfully, the North Star was in the sky, and I summoned all my courage to get to Terminal F. But like, no, I got here for a reason. Like, I'm standing here right now. There are, there are these circumstances where people, people just don't turn on their brains, and they don't do it out of malice necessarily to me. And that's why I say I'm just trying to explain that implicit bias, bias that's not even intentional, exists. And then you see this bias that actually is above the surface and creates somebody dying because of it. And I just want to say, like, mine's small potatoes, but, like, let's stop it there before it goes any further at the very least. Jason Benetti joins us here on the show, White Sox voice, ESPN voice, one of my favorite people in sports. So you work closely with a lot of people of color on your broadcasts in and around sports. What has been your feeling from those that are close to you that have a real personal personal situation or a personal experience with what the protests are about and racial inequality? I just I, I hear it and I'm heartbroken. When somebody tells me, like, I hear it and I hear things that have been said to me, but on a grander scale, a more dangerous scale. I, the only thing I have to worry about when it comes to the police is if somebody pulls me over at midnight and they ask me to walk a line because they think I've been drinking, because I am absolutely going to Attica if that's the case, because <laughs> there's no straight line in me. For my friends, people of color, who have been thrown into the back of a police vehicle and have done nothing wrong. That will make you real skeptical of the police and it'll do it real fast. We, the, the hardest part about being different is knowing in your heart that you are right, that you are being treated differently because of your skin color for them, for me, my disability. And then having all these forces say, no, no, we didn't. No, we weren't doing that. I know you're not telling the truth. And I know you're not doing it intentionally. But like, there's this test that people at Harvard created called the implicit association test. And it tests for subconscious bias. And you go take the test. I learned about it in law school. You go take the test. And it's like pairing good words with white people and bad words with black people. And then they flip it. And it tells like, how quickly you're willing to subconsciously pair a good word with a white person and a bad word with a black person. And then they have one for gender and they have one for disability as well. I took the disability test in 2011 and I was biased against people with disability. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> that's pretty awful. And then you realize that like stigma is pretty well rooted in America. And, like, I, I'm not trying to blame people for that because I have it myself. Like, we all make decisions of bias. But when it gets to the point of somebody's life being taken because of bias, that's not unconscious anymore. That's, that's above water. Like, that person knows what they're doing. And at some point, it's like, first of all, the implicit bias needs to go away. But the explicit stuff where we're killing people, that's flat out unacceptable. 